Very good. All right. Well, welcome everybody uh, to session B1. Uh, this is the first of two sessions about astrophysics with Lisa. Uh, we have a number of, of speakers to talk about a couple aspects of uh, Lisa astrophysics. We're going to break this session into two sections. Uh, we have uh, three talks followed by a coffee break, uh, followed by another set of talks. And I should have introduced myself. Uh, my name is Ira Thorpe. I'm a, a scientist at the Goddard Space Flight Center uh, in Greenbelt, Maryland, and I'm going to be chairing this session. Um, I'll ask that people who are interested in asking questions, uh, please put those questions in the chat. Uh, our IT host will also take questions out of the YouTube live stream and move them into the chat. And I'll prompt the speakers to ask those answer those questions at the end of their talks um, uh, by, by reading out the questions in the chat. So without further ado, uh, we're going to move on to the first talk of our session uh, by Sylvain Marsat about sky localization of massive black hole mergers with LISA. Uh, take it away, Sylvain. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to give this uh, presentation. Um, we start with a very short introduction. Uh, so, uh, massive black holes are, of course, primary targets for lizards, the primary candidates for alien counterparts. And it's an important question to know what uh, are um, what lizards' capabilities for the for the localization are going to be both for uh, post-merger signals, but also for uh, pre-merger signal in advance of the coalescence. In this work, we used the following tools to address these questions, uh, a mixture of uh, fast Fisher matrix estimations and Bayesian parameter estimation, uh, and IMA, uh, its parameter, its parameter bring down waveforms with alliance pins uh, and higher harmonics. We do not include it yet, waveforms with precession and eccentricity, nor uh, the realistic uh, aspect of the instruments like gaps, glitches, uh, and the global fit. And if you're interested in this topic, you should also follow the uh, connected talks listed here. So first, a reminder about the uh, LISA instrumental response that matters a lot for the uh, localization capability. So LISA is moving in the stabling motion um, and start, uh, orbiting the Earth. And the response takes the form that is uh, written in the two formulas here. Um, What's important here is that the response has both a time and frequency dependency, time because of the motion of LISA, frequency because of the departure from the long wavelength uh, approximation. In uh, the limit of low frequencies, you go back to the case of two detectors, uh, LIGO type detectors rotated by pi over four from each other and in motion, but uh, in general at high frequencies, it's more complicated. For short lived signals, it makes sense to go to the frame of LISA uh, at the time of merger. It simplifies a lot of the structure. If you do this, you can uh, see from the functional form the response that you have. Uh, you can expect degeneracy patterns um, that are essentially reflected uh, with respect to the plane of laser with eight potential degenerate modes uh, in the in the sky localization. Massive black hole binaries, as you know, are uh, flagship sources signals for laser. They can be extremely loud. As what's illustrated on the left, you have a, a waterfall plot as a function of uh, source frame mass and the rate shift of the synapse noise ratio, you can reach uh, SNRs of uh, 2000. And at these SNRs, everything matter, matter, every detail matters. Uh, in particular, higher harmonics in the signal uh, enrich the structure of the signal. They play a crucial role uh, in breaking degeneracies. Um, and one should say that most of the time is uh, for now still missing uh, position in eccentricity, which will be important to include in the future. So those results are not uh, say definitive. Um, when we say that uh, MPHB signals are very loud, uh, it's worth pointing out reminding that most of this SNR accumulates in the last hours or directly at coalescence. This is the equivalent of the plot I've just shown, but simply one week prior to merger and two days prior to merger. So the merger itself really um, carries most of the SNR generation. I'm going to say a word of the tools that we use in this study. So we aim at doing Bayesian analysis, so producing uh, samples from the posterior uh, distribution of the parameters, uh, using the likelihood that it simply is the square norm of residuals. Uh, and uh, it's important to know that producing samples from posterior takes uh, millions of variations of uh, likelihood to explore a multidimensional parameter space. So there are different approximations of that can. Fisher matrix, just in short, is a local Gaussian approximation for the log likelihood around the true value of the injected signal. It's, it's meant to work in the highest limit, but it misses the genesis entirely. Uh, it's only a local approximation. But uh, you can also do uh, 
full parameter estimation and uh, there are um, various levels uh, of detail of uh, refinement. What we do here is simplify P, which means we know what the injected signal here is. So we do uh, an actual MCMC, but still localize on the value of the source. So it still allows us to explore parameter space and degeneracy. Uh, but it's not the full um, uh, the full analysis, and in particular, we uh, leave aside the global fit aspects where you have to consider correlations with other sources. Um, our tools are in a package called Isabetta. That is, uh, I'm not going to detail the list of features here. Uh, it's just tell you that this package is available to full members, uh, and we aim at having a completely public release um, at some point in the near future. Okay, so let's move on to uh, our study and the results that we got. So uh, first, we did uh, Fisher matrix based uh, study. So we include major and higher many in the waveforms, but we do simply Fisher matrix. Uh, the Fisher matrix simply scales with natural ratio, which means it simply scales with luminosity distance of the signal, which means if you compute the uh, uh, Fisher matrix um, at a given reference redshift, you have computed it for all, um, all other redshifts as long as you keep the redshifted mass fixed. And this is the result that we get. Uh, randomizing over mass ratio, spin orientation, everything but uh, source frame, uh, frame mass. Uh, that is illustrated here at redshift one. You can see there is a large variation due to this um, randomization over, over everything, up to four orders of magnitude variation. So we cannot tell you at this mass and redshift, zero is going to be this. Um, there is going to be this huge variation. Now, if you translate this, if you scale this with a scenario, you get the following counterpart for the sky localization of Lisa in terms of square degrees. Um, usually here, the middle plot is the median, uh, the dashed and the full lines uh, to give you a scale correspond to the 10 square degrees and 0 0.4 square degrees field of views of LSST and, uh, and Athena wide field imaging. And you can see on the left and the right, the 5% best and 5% worst systems are quite extreme with respect to the reference uh, result. Um, what's interesting is to look at what the most um, important uh, parameters uh, in determining this uh, variation. Uh, and we found that this is essentially inclination and latitude in the laser frame. So here you can see on the left, the signal to noise ratio, on the right, the scale localization. Um, keeping just uh, taking a reference system 10 to the 6 solar masses of ratio one and varying inclination and beta L uh, parameter, this latitude parameter. Um, and you can see on the right that these two parameters together can generate four orders of magnitude variation. Um, and you can see that also the trend goes against the trend for the natural ratio for the latitude. Right. Uh, you can do the same exercise for the distance determination that enters the uh, say volume error determination, localization of the source. You get the same kind of uh, large uh, dispersion by four dollars of, four dollars of magnitude when you randomize over, over everything. It's important here to note to note that the gravitational wave error uh, is not the only one. Uh, you, if you want to convert distance luminosity to a redshift, you also have to take into account weak lensing effect uh, and peculiar motion effects. And this is illustrated on the right. And uh, you can see so the different curves correspond to different masses with their spread. And you can see that in a vast part of the parameter space, the weak lensing uh, distance error actually dominates over the lead error. So this is absolutely crucial to, to take into account. Um, you can convert these errors into galaxy counts. So this is done just as an illustration here in a very, very simplistic way. Uh, we just take a simulated catalog, which is has not, no other cut than a, a mass cut um, in the mass of the galaxy at more than at 10 to the 10 solar masses. We obtain, say, a density, the end of the omega, as a function of redshift. We convert our error volumes into these uh, counts of galaxies, and we obtain the result on the right. Um, this is zoomed in, right, uh, only up to redshift two. And you can see that there is a region where we get to order of a few, or order one, um, galaxies, I mean, these massive galaxies in the lizard error box. But of course, when we need much more details to the about the content, uh, what these galaxies are and what this really mean in terms of identifying the source. We went further and did beyond uh, fission matrix uh, only study. We uh, performed uh, parameter estimation simulations for catalogs 
simulated catalogs from some magnetic models for three models that kind of bracket the astrophysical uncertainty about the population, Q3D, Q3ND, and Q3. So they are, uh, I'm not going to detail what they are, they just uh, bracket our astrophysical uncertainty, say. They are illustrated here uh, in terms of uh, source mass and redshift. And we um, perform this uh, Bayesian parameter estimation that allows us to look for sky degeneracies that the Fisher matrix is unable to capture. So you have illustrated here on the top right examples, you could have one mode, two modes, or eight modes sky degeneracies. And this is colored in uh, um, respectively blue, red, and yellow in these uh, catalogs. And you can see that we can locate in parameter space where the degeneracies, sky degeneracies occur. One should also say that if you select, don't select these catalogs for uh, counterpart candidates, you can see Albert Mangelis talk. Um, these modalities uh, are uh, rarer because you kind of pre select for low rate shift uh, EM uh, counterpart candidates. If, um, right, you can uh, do the same exercise as, as before, um, simply um, converting um, your errors to, so we have sky area errors, but we can have also volume errors that we can uh, convert to galaxy counts. And what's shown here is for these catalogs, the cumulative number of sources for four years for uh, sky area errors values and galaxy count values. Again, the dash in full on the top illustrate um, uh, Athena and SST uh, field of use. And uh, on the bottom, you have the magical number of one. So you can see that we do not expect to have uh, um, in four years, uh, we expect to have less than one source that is actually identified as a sole host. But what's interesting is the region between 1, 10, and 100. What can you do when you have only a few of these hosts in the Lisa box? Um, next, I'm going to present a few uh, results about pre merger analysis this time. So, pre merger analysis um, localization is much more challenging to do with these. Uh, than the post merger, as I've illustrated with the, simply the level of SNR that you have uh, pre merger versus post merger. So for this study, we just focus on um, some golden sources, say, uh, that are extremely favorable at redshift one and one that we call a platinum source at redshift 0 0.3. Um, so this is the best part of the is parameter space, as illustrated on the right. For these sources, if you look at accumulation of SNR with time and um, uncertainty about the time of merger uh, as a function of time, um, you can see that it's easy. So you detect them comfortably in advance. And you can also um, locate the time of coalescence quite comfortably in advance. This is very important for uh, instrumental aspects. We want reserved periods of quiet data uh, when the merger happens. So this is relatively easy to do for these sources. If you look at the sky localization as a function of time, you get uh, these kind of results. Um, and you can see it's quite challenging. Um, we uh, did that with both Fisher and MCMC analysis on a reduced set. Uh, there is, again, large uh, dispersion. So the best sources and the worst sources are very far apart. And you can see that even uh, reaching down to one hour before major is challenging to go uh, below the um, say the Athena uh, field of view, uh, except maybe for the platinum source, which I remind you is at, uh, set at which is 0.3. Um, that's kind of the maximally best source that we allowed ourselves to uh, study. And you can see there was a big jump in all those plots between the localization that you uh, achieve, uh, say a few hours before major and the one that you achieve um, uh, post major. But of course we can ask, that's particularly important for the platinum source, what happens if you you have already some localization, say 10 square degrees, one month before this happens? So you could also tile a relatively big um, area in the sky with many observations, and we um, uh, that's uh, something that is uh, currently uh, under investigation. Um, Sylvain, you have about two minutes left. All right, uh, this is my second to last slide. Thank you. Um, and another uh, important aspect uh, also of pre major localization is that uh, the analysis and the modalities can be more important. So this is illustrated here with this kind of uh, examples of platinum, gold source, and the heavy source. 
On the right, you have the localization at Maja. In all these three cases, it's a beautifully Gaussian, well localized uh, uh, system, uh, posterior distribution, say. But um, for all but the very best platinum source, you can have strong degeneracies all the way up to a uh, few hours before Maja. In the case of heavy signals, it's particularly notable that you do not have one but eight positions in the sky. So uh, these degeneracies are present and they are more severe when you do pre-major uh, localization than when you do uh, post-major localization, as I showed before. Right, I'm reaching my uh, conclusions and outlook. So we have explored these localization capabilities for massive black holes. Um, we have seen that massive black holes signals are major dominated. There is a big difference between post-major and uh, pre-major localization. Post-major localization can be indeed very good. Pre-major can be a bit challenging except for the very best fans. And we have explored uh, where do the degeneracies in sky position uh, occur. And uh, there are, of course, many improvements uh, that we want to have. Uh, in particular, we want more realistic analysis. We want to do the analysis in the presence of superposition of multiple signals. Aliza is going to be well fit. Uh, all I've presented was just a single source. We want realistic noise that are uh, artifacts like gaps and glitches. And it's also going to be important to include more realistic waveforms, including precession and inconsistency in the Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you. I see some, some claps coming. Uh, it, it, it appears um, that there are no questions from YouTube, and I have not seen any questions in the Zoom chat. I'd encourage people to uh, put some in there. And while you're typing away, I have a couple questions. Uh, I'll start with one, which is um, you were looking at the uh, this distribution of sources, and I think you, you showed very clearly how there's a wide variety of capabilities uh, depending upon what the source gives us. And then you, you highlighted these platinum sources. I'm, I'm curious how far out on the on the distribution is that platinum source you know we, we you had a plot of the best five percent sources is it best one percent best you know point one percent right so maybe we can get a sense for this uh it's the best uh uh say you expect less than one of these in uh say in uh in four years I do not have the exact number. Yeah, uh, or, or, or I, 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 another question I had had was on, you, you show these catalogs of 90 years, and while we'd all love for Lisa to run for 90 years, I don't think that's likely. Uh, but I, I imagine that was just to build up the statistics. Um, exactly, exactly. So in that 90-year catalog, I'm, I'm sorry, in that 90-year catalog, how many platinum sources are there? W one, five, ten? Uh, a bit less than one. So you basically have... Uh, factor uh, 1 over 25 to apply on uh, on this figure uh, and uh, already at less than redshift 1 say if you want the best region that is uh, the lightest colored uh, you don't have 25 sources in there okay thank you well when you point out that these rates are, are quite uncertain of course the rates themselves um, uh, but yeah the platinum is a uh, is quite optimistic. Pl platinum um, is rare, um, as as the name would imply. Okay, yeah. um, we do have one question, uh, which I'll just read uh, from Karan Jani, and it is: Does Lisa's initial orientation in parentheses how the satellites are placed in the circle impact sky localization? So, for this one of signals, what what matters most really is uh, um, is the position of the source in the sky of Lisa in the Lisa frame. Right. So you just move to the frame where the one x y plane is Lisa, and uh, and you get all the structure. And we found that um, that's basically all there, um, all there is. I mean, the uh, the only thing that breaks this degeneracy is the direction of the uh, say the Doppler, uh, main Doppler shift of the machine around the sun. Uh, but um, that's subdominant for for this. So basically, all the structure is um, can be read off if you, if you change variables. To All right. Yeah. And Karan indicates his appreciation for that answer. Well, let's uh, thank Sylvan again. And let me invite our second speaker, uh, Chinmay Gandavikar, to bring up his slides.
Hello. Yes, uh, we can hear you. I, I think I'm still seeing Sylvan's slides. Um, all right. Well, while Chinmai is getting his slides up, it looks like they're on the way. I'll just introduce the talk. This talk is going to be on uh, finding unknown black holes using EMRI and IMRI detections. That is an E and an I uh, with Lisa. Uh, so please, whenever you're ready, take it away. All right. Um, great. Uh, so I'm out of the booth? Yes, you are. Ah, cool. Um, so firstly, thank you to the organizers for giving me this chance of presenting my work here. And uh, my work, which is titled Finding Unknown Black Holes Using MDs and IMRI Detections in DISA. So this work is in with collaboration with Dr. Jani, my, uh, Dr. Michael Katz, and Professor Kelly Holly Bokelman from Vanderbilt. And uh, yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah. So, um, uh, the LBK observations, the LIGO Virgo Kagra observations, have shed light on the black holes of mass that were previously not, like we did not know if they existed or not. And uh, uh, for example, the PIS and mass cap and uh, the lower mass cap of about two to five solar masses. Uh, also, LVK has provided a very strong observational constraint on sub solar mass black, uh, black holes, which are like dark matter candidates. And also on uh, light IMBHS, which is like intermediate mass black holes. Um, however, the ground-based detectors are uh, confined to scenarios where binaries have comparable mass ratio. Uh, or, I mean, com uh, yeah, the constituents have the comparable mass. So uh, our question is that can these observations of uh, these higher mass uh, ratio in spirals uh, or higher mass uh, ratio binaries uh, open a window to uh, like a full uh, to full astrophysical population. So that's the motivation behind our work. Yeah. So since we are talking about these high mass ratio black holes or like these extremes or intermediate mass ratio black holes, we uh, we we used uh, uh, according we used the waveform generators accordingly. So we use this fast memory waveforms, which is a part of the uh, BHP toolkit, the black hole perturbation toolkit, which is primarily developed by uh, Dr. Michael Katz from AEI, um, who actually had a nice talk yesterday in the LDC uh, workshop session. I think he's also presenting right now in a, another parallel session. So yeah, we have primarily based our waveform generation on, uh, on, on that package. Yeah, so here, uh, so to generate a waveform, we would primarily need the initial uh, two, two masses in detector frame, uh, the luminosity distance, the eccentricity, the spin, a spin of the primary black hole, mainly because the spin of the secondary black hole wouldn't be that important if the, I mean, because the plunge is not, um, because, because the secondary black hole is way too small and, and it's, 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 it's not at the first order that that spin would matter. And, uh, then we use the initial separate tricks. So that I'll just come to in a moment. And we also use the viewing angle, the polar and the azimuthal viewing angle. The DT, that is the sampling time uh, for the waveform gener uh, generation and the integration time capital T. Um, yeah. So on the right, here we can see uh, that we are generating a waveform for a black hole of uh, about 10, uh, sorry, 10 million solar masses and about 100 solar masses. Uh, binary, uh, which is at one gigaparsec distance away. And uh, we can see that the waveform generation is happening from in, in positive time, time direction. So that is, we start from an initial separatrix or an initial separation between the two uh, masses and we go ahead till the plunge. The plunge is not modeled here, but uh, the main SNR, uh, main contribution to the SNR is because of the in-spiral. So we are mainly focusing on that. Um, yeah, we are using eccentricity um, because there will be a, the, I mean, when the secondary uh, black hole is like, or the secondary mass is uh, captured by the primary one, uh, it will have some initial velocity. So that could be a reason behind the initial eccentricity and which we are, uh, which we expect it to be around 0.2 or something. 
so we are using that eccentricity um we are taking uh, initial spin of the primary uh, black hole to be about zero uh, i mean of course the spin will increase with i mean the snr will increase with spin and uh, having taking spin as zero will be a um, it will be a conservative choice here um yeah and this separate trick p not that is the initial distance between the black holes before like let's say four years before the merger uh, is <clears throat> is is obtained using a function which is given in the package itself yeah the choice of dt is uh, based on the time period of the last stable orbit um yeah and and we take a uh, we have a we we take a we take the dt proportional to the uh, time period of the last stable orbit now it is not exactly equal to the last uh, time period of the last stable orbit mainly because uh, there might be some eccentricity which may not die completely towards the end and which could cause some uh, difference in uh, um, like dt and the last stable orbit time period yeah and we are yes integrating the all the waveforms are integrated for four years um yeah which is also the time period like the projective time period of uh, the lisa machine yeah so here uh, on the right we have strain on the y axis and on the x axis we have time in years and uh, we have zoomed in a bit of uh, the same data uh, which is like a one day data uh, one one day strain signal time series yeah so after generating the waveforms um, we would like to move to like converting the time series waveform into frequency domain or frequency series uh, which we do by uh, normal numpy uh, fft now uh, when the numpy uh, when, when we perform the fft we see that uh, there is this tail which lies behind or at the lower frequency end of our signal that um, has been trimmed off later on but that could be this this could be an effect of the uh, discrete fourier transform that we are doing and uh, yeah so that is uh, trimmed out uh, and and the residual or the main signal is then taken forward for snr calculation so snr calculation we are doing as prescribed in uh, robson et al the robson nilje cornish paper um, the the method is pretty uh, uh, straightforward we have snr square uh, as the uh, integration over the ratio of uh, f uh, like fourier domain signal uh, squared divided by the uh, pst of the detector and under root over that would be our snr now um, now that we have a signal and we have uh, yeah now that we have a signal we want to make sure that it is detectable so using the threshold uh, snr of 10 we are able to find the horizon distance or the distance up to which uh, we will be reliably uh, we will reliably see an event and uh, yes so whatever is the luminosity distance of the event that can be used to obtain the cosmological redshift using the planck 15 cosmology and uh, that redshift is then used to convert the masses of the binaries into source frame because uh, as we mentioned before the waveform generator takes the masses as an detector frame and we want since we want to do astrophysics on this data we are converting the same into a uh, source frame um all right yeah so this uh, image yeah so in uh, in the previous presentation uh, you might i mean uh, we 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 noticed that there was this uh, one very beautiful uh, image uh, which showed how the uh, different Uh, events or different binaries will show in uh, uh, in different detectors and how um, how emrys and how different modes of emrys will show so here is a very similar plot um, the only difference that we have made here is that we have actually plotted the uh, emry and emry signals in frequency domain um yeah so let me just go over the plot once Uh, on x axis we have our frequency uh, and on y axis we have a characteristic strain here we have the uh, psd of lisa and uh, on the higher frequency side we also show the uh, psd not psd but like uh, yeah detector noise for uh, einstein telescope and aligo um yeah 
and as mentioned in the previous talk as well in in, in the initial phase of the previous talk um the massive black hole binaries would be a very strong signal for the uh, for lisa to detect uh, however the relatively lower mass black holes like uh, like something about in the orders of 10 power 2 uh, solar masses uh, if if they are equal if that was in an equal mass binary that wouldn't be detectable uh, very significantly in lisa uh, only a very initial part of its in, in spiral would be now our uh, what we want to show with this plot is um, you might see that uh, even a supermassive black hole of the order of 10 million solar masses uh, relatively heavy, heavy stellar mass black hole of about 100 solar masses and intermediate mass black hole of 10 power 5 solar masses. Uh, it's, it's a wider range of solar of, of black holes in the, uh, yeah, in, in the masses that can be detected using LISA uh, if they are a part of EMRI or an IMRI. Uh, if, or in other words, if they are a part of a higher mass ratio binary. Yeah. Um, all right, so yeah. So in the previous talk as well, I mean, I, we saw a very beautiful uh, waterfall plot, which was for uh, comparable mass binaries, which can be detected using LISA. Um, and the, the, the plot ranges from like up, starting from up to 100 solar masses and goes up till about 10 power nine solar masses. Uh, here on the on right, we show a little glimpse of how an Emery uh, waterfall plot would look like. So on our x-axis, we have the total mass of the black hole uh, or the total mass of the primary black hole or the uh, entire Emery. Uh, on y-axis, we have the luminosity distance of where the event is, uh, event is occurring and the colors are for the SNRs. Um, now you can see that uh, Oh yeah, and we have chosen a moderate eccentricity of 0.2, initial eccentricity of 0.2. Um, yeah, now since we want to like work with the astrophysical uh, uh, astrophysics of these uh, systems, we do uh, plot only the uh, source frame mass. And uh, as the distance increases, we expect the uh, cosmological redshift to increase, which causes the peaks to tilt towards the left or in other words just reduce the mass uh, in uh, source frame yeah so now you have about three minutes remaining oh okay yeah so yes so here is a short uh, image of how we show or of how snrs are varying with uh, spin and eccentricity uh, we see that there is a, a total factor of about five from the lowest spin and lowest eccentricity to up to highest spin and highest eccentricity. So to have a conservative uh, SNR uh, uh, estimation, we are using low spin, low eccentricity or, or zero spin and low eccentricity. Um, all right, uh, now this is our main result. So this is the plot which shows how, uh, uh, this is the plot which is showing uh, the entire uh, parameter space of masses against uh, the horizon distance. So horizon distance is for the SNR of 10 here. And uh, M1, that is the primary mass, is uh, ranging from up to 10 power 3 to 10 power 7, which is uh, four orders of magnitude. And uh, the secondary mass is from 10 power minus 1 to 10 power 3, again, a four uh, order of magnitude of uh, distribution. And uh, on the uh, uh, the colors are for the horizon distance. So here we have shown uh, how how far Andromeda Galaxy or how far uh, Virgo Cluster and how far our GW 1905-21 is. Um, yeah. So which is which is the furthest that we have seen using a gravitational wave signal? I, uh, I believe. Yeah. So we have divided the plot into three sections. One is for uh, IMRIs, that is like uh, 10 power 2 to 10 power 4 solar masses, uh, uh, mass ratio. IMRIs, that is from 10 power 4 to 10 power 6 uh, mass ratio. And extreme, um, extremely, uh, ext like super extreme mass ratios, uh, mass ratio in spirals of uh, more than 10 power 6 uh, 
of mass ratio. Yeah. And this over here, the white patch over here is for the comparable mass binaries, which we cannot, we, which we are not sure if we'll be reliably getting the data uh, signals, I mean, the, yeah, data for using the fast MD waveforms that we are using. So here, um, as of now, the thing, uh, as of now, the black holes that we haven't seen or we haven't expected to observe in the other um, missions are subsolar mass, uh, dark matter candidates kind of black hole, the lower mass, uh, lower gap black holes that is from two to five solar masses, the PISN gap black holes, uh, and the light IMBHs, uh, light intermediate mass black holes. Yeah. So they, they do show significant uh, detectabilities up to a very far away distance. So to summarize from this plot, uh, we have this table. So if we have a subsolar mass black hole, um, and if, if it is a part of an IMRI, the best detection radius that we can have is about 100 kiloparsecs. And, uh, if, uh, and if, we, if it is a part of an IMRI, it could have a detection radius of up to uh, 350 megaparsecs. Um, on the other hand, if we have like uh, low mass black holes of about five solar masses, we have the detection radius of up to like one gigaparsec. And as a part of MD, we would observe them till 14 gigaparsecs. Uh, if, if we have PIS and low, uh, lower mass black hole of about 60 uh, M sun uh, solar masses, we'll observe it till 100 gigaparsec if it is a part of an IMRI. And if it is a part of an emery, uh, I mean, that is like, yeah, if it is a part of an emery, we would observe it till 17 gigaparsecs. Yeah, and if PISN, higher, higher, uh, higher mass PISN black hole, we would observe it till 180 gigaparsecs in emeries and up to 440 uh, gigaparsecs as a part of emeries. And if we have the light IMBHs, about, which are about a like, thousand solar masses, uh, we will see them Till 100, uh, 10 gigaparsecs in IMRIs and 320 gigaparsecs in MRIs. Now it's interesting to see that uh, we are able to observe IMBHs till Z of 27. And uh, yeah, the LBK rates for most of these candidates have been, uh, I mean, have been predicted. And uh, it would be interesting. It would be interesting to uh, integrate that into our study as well. Um, yeah, so here is a brief conclusion. So we have used the state-of-the-art Emory waveform generator that is fast Emory waveforms. And we discovered that uh, LISA shows promising potential at detecting almost all the unknown black holes. Uh, maximum detectability of the black holes is seen when they are a part of Emory or Emory. Uh, if the primary black hole weighs about 10 power four to 10 power five solar masses, um, yeah, the galactic sub uh, galactic subsolar uh, black holes or the primordial, uh, which could be of primordial in nature, are observed if they are like uh, at max up to hundred kiloparsecs. While an optimistic up, uh, estimate uh, would give us an uh, give us a number of about one gigaparsec. Sorry, uh, if we are looking at a PISN IMBH binary, they are observable between hundred megaparsecs and a PISN SMBH, a supermassive black hole binary, then up to 100 gig, uh, gigaparsec, which is way beyond the uh, currently observed furthest binary of GW190521. Uh, yeah, and if we have an IMBH SMBH, uh, well, we, uh, we they'll be practically across all the observable universe. Yeah, we can observe them using LISA across the entire uh, observable universe. And uh, yeah, the future uh, work that we are planning is uh, using the LVK rates to estimate the number of uh, uh, similar black hole sources in the region, uh, LISA band, um, and also create a mock LISA catalog for such unknown black hole sources. All right, uh, let's thank uh, Chinmay again. Um, unfortunately, we do not have time to read out any questions uh, so that we can move on to the next speaker, but there are some questions in the chat. Uh, I encourage you, Jemai, to go ahead and answer those sure. questions uh, in the chat as the next speaker uh, moves forward. So uh, the next speaker is uh, Sajad Ahmad Bhatt, uh, and I'd like Sajad to please put his uh, slides up. He's going to be speaking on the pre-merger localization of intermediate mass binary black holes in LISA and that astrophysical implications. So 
uh, sounds like a nice, uh, nicely related to both of our, our prior talks in uh, this session. A reminder, after this session, we will have a coffee break. All right, take it away, Sajad. Hello, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for providing me this opportunity to present my work here. So the title of my talk is Pre-Merger Localization of Intermediate Mass Binary Black Holes in LISA and Astrophysical Implications, wherein I will uh, I will focus how well we can uh, localize, uh, localize the intermediate mass binary black holes before their merger and what will be um, the astrophysical implications of that. This work is done in collaboration with uh, Pankaj Saidi and KG Arun from Chennai Mathematical Institute. Let me introduce. So the existence of intermediate mass black holes with masses between 10 to the 2 to 10 to the power 4 has been a long-standing puzzle in astronomy. Uh, these black holes present a missing link between the stellar mass black holes and the supermassive black holes. We have enough evidence for the uh, st both the stellar mass black holes and the supermassive black holes, but we don't have any, uh, uh, till recently we didn't have, uh, I mean, conclusive evidence for the existence of intermediate mass black holes. But recently the detection of the GW 1905-1 by LIGO Virgo collaboration, uh, uh, which produced a remnant of 150 solar mass, provides a, provides a cleanest signature for the existence of intermediate mass black holes. Uh, and uh, where, where the formation of uh, this intermediate mass black holes was uh, explained uh, uh, by the, it can be explained uh, by the repeated merger of the uh, component of black holes. Yeah, so the formation and detection of these uh, black holes, there are several likely formation channels. Uh, one is the mergers in the dense environments like nuclear star clusters, uh, globular clusters, uh, and also they can be formed uh, by the direct collapse of gas cloud at higher redshift. Uh, moreover, these uh, black holes are expected to exist at the centers of dwarf galaxies, and LISA is capable of detecting the binary black holes in the mass range 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 7. Uh, solar mass uh, up to a redshift of uh, up to a redshift of shift of around uh, 20 and uh, the intermediate uh, mass black hole is uh, in the range from around 500 to 10 to the power 4 uh, solar mass will inspiral in the LISA band and uh, they coalesce in the frequency band of the ground based detectors and this uh, this mass range actually uh, facilitates the multiband detection of uh, these sources now, so, so how, how we can do the multi messenger astronomy with the intermediate mass black holes? So, LISA's orbital motion helps in breaking the degeneracies among the uh, binary parameters and hence facilitates the precise source lo localization. And this precise source localization will help uh, providing early warning to the electromagnetic telescopes like, uh, like LSST and Athena for optimizing their observational strategies. And the joint electromagnetic and and uh, GW observations of these intermediate mass black holes uh, can put stringent constraints on the cosmological parameters as Hubble constant. Uh, even in the absence of magnetic counterpart, um, uh, Hubble constant can be constrained statistically using galaxy catalogs, provided we have large number of uh, or large number of such events. Yeah. So now I will discuss uh, discuss the setup uh, for our uh, analysis. So we use uh, the Taylor F2 waveform model and take Lisa's orbital motion into account. And uh, we use the Fisher information matrix to obtain the uh, errors on the binary parameters and uh, our parameter space is shown here. Uh, while TC5C is the time and phase of collisions and these two are the uh, mass parameters and this is and these thetas and uh, phi's uh, give the, uh, the position and orientation of the binary and covering card to the signals. We fix uh, the mass ratio to be uh, two is one and uh, consider sources uh, fixed at a luminosity distance of three giga per sec. And the time of, uh, time of uh, 
in, in the list. Recorded as a function of uh, before the time left uh, before the merger. Uh, you you can see you can see that for all the uh, for all the four systems. So uh, SNR uh, SNR uh, increases as we move closer to the merger as the system accumulate, accumulates more and more uh, SNR. Uh, and the high mass high mass system is uh, since the luminosity distance is fixed at three giga per second as I said. The high mass systems have more SNR as compared to the low mass. Low mass systems, and uh, moreover, if you see in the last month before the merger, uh, the high mass systems are accumulating most of most of the SNR during this period. So, in short, for all the sources, we have a good enough SNR uh, even one month before the merger. I mean, all the SNRs are uh, greater than uh, twenty uh, before one month of the of the merger. So, which validates our Fisher information analysis. Yeah. So, given the good SNR is uh, even one month before the merger, we we have uh, uh, here I am showing the sky position and luminosity distance errors on these two as a function of uh, uh, time left before merger. If you see the sky position, then uh, this position is improving as we move closer to the merger for all the systems. Um, for uh, for the low mass systems, the second resolution is better as compared to the high mass systems because uh, these low mass systems will spend large number of uh, cycles in the um, in the in the frequency band of the laser, and the laser's orbital motion uh, will help in breaking degeneracy among the parameters, and hence facilitates the better localization of these sources. And the high mass systems uh, show a sharp uh, improvement in the uh, in the second lo localization, because as as I said in the SNR plot only, uh, already that uh, these systems accumulate most of the SNR in the in the last period when they are close to the uh, close to the merger. So uh, apart from the good uh, second second local, if you see uh, for for the one thousand uh, one thousand case, even at uh, around one week before the merger, we have. Uh, around 0.5 square degrees, which is a good uh, localization, and which further improved around 0.4 square degrees uh, at uh, one hour before the merger. Yeah, which uh, which can be helpful in early warning to the electromagnetic telescopes. Um, yeah, so the now the right polar shows the uh, errors in the luminosity distance as a as a function of time left before merger. If you see in this case. Uh, for the high mass systems, um, for the high mass systems, the uh, errors errors in the uh, luminosity distance are better because, uh, as I said in the SNR plot, the uh, SNR for these uh, systems is uh, greater as compared to the low mass systems, and also uh, these uh, high mass systems accumulate most of the SNR in the uh, in in last month before the merger, and that's why they show a sharp improvement in the um, uh, in in the measurement of luminosity distance uh, when we move closer to the merger. So now we have uh, good SNR, good circular localization, and uh, good uh, measurement of the luminosity distance. Apart from that, if you see the uh, time of collisions, so. Uh, here, this plot shows the time of uh, accuracy of the time of uh, collision is uh, as a function of time before the merger. And in this plot, you can see uh, even at uh, around one day before merger, the time of collision can be measured within ten within ten second accuracy. So, which is which is which is actually extremely good precision uh, for uh, for uh, providing early warning telescopes. Uh, so that they can look for any uh, optical or some other uh, counterpart in some other band. Yeah. So ap apart from this, the, uh, in the right plot, I'm showing the polarization resolution as a function of time left before merger. Uh, this uh, polarization resolution actually shows uh, how well we are able to resolve the orbital angular moment or if there is any jetted uh, jetted emission from the binary, how well we can resolve that. 
and this is um, and if you if you see if you see around if uh, one day or uh, I mean one hour before the merger, we are getting uh, polarization resolution between five to ten uh, square degrees. And in case of lower mass system, that's around uh, around fifty uh, fifty square degrees. Yeah. So uh, in this plot shows the errors in the chop mass and symmetric mass ratio as a function of uh, time before the merger. So in this case, you can see that the chop mass uh, errors in the chop mass for low mass system is uh, very good. Uh, it, even one day before, even one day before the merger, it's around uh, ten to the power minus six. And uh, for the yeah, for low mass systems, it is very good as compared. It's better as compared to the high mass systems because, uh, as I said earlier, low mass systems is cycles uh, uh, in the Lisa band, and and uh, that will uh, and Lisa's orbital motion will uh, reduce the degeneracy and improve the uh, improve the accuracy in the measurement of chop mass. And same thing happens in case of uh, in, in case of the symmetric mass ratio, and we can we can see that. Um, at one hour before the merger, we will have for 1000 solar mass, we will have around 1% um, accuracy. Yeah, so these extremely good measurements of the mass measurements along with the uh, along with uh, possibly along with the spin measurements uh, uh, from laser can be combined with the ground based detectors and, and that can help in uh, testing the nature of uh, nature of gravity. Yeah, now I will discuss the astrophysical implications. So now, <clears throat> so, so if, if the intermediate mass binary black hole merger happens in a gaseous environment, so the interaction of the merger imminent with the ambient gas which made in can produce electromagnetic emission. Uh, and the kicked black hole remnant, uh, it interacts with the unportable un un gas uh, uh, outside and it produces shocks which can lead to the emission of uh, optical uh, emission in the ultraviolet or optical band. And uh, first, uh, first it uh, interacts with the bound gas around it and then it comes out of the bound gas and it interacts with the unportable gas which is, uh, which is outside and it leads to the uh, BHL accretion as it is dragged by this gas. So you have about the, three minutes remaining. Yeah, the corresponding luminosity is given by this equation, uh, um, and the detection condition for this is uh, m should be less than m, which is the threshold uh, apparent magnitude for the LSST. Um, and for the best result, one thousand solar mass, this apparent magnitude at three giga per second, uh, thirteen point six, uh, which is very less than as compared to this uh, uh, for the LSST, which is twenty six. And uh, this counterpart can be easily detected with LSST. Similarly, uh, we can consider uh, we can consider a generic uh, generic case for the this binary black hole, while uh, either both the components or the remnant. Uh, uh, through accretion can emit x-ray uh, in the x-ray domain uh, then and the, that flux uh, emitted is given by this uh, equation and the flux sensitivity for uh, Athena for a five sigma detection will is given by this uh, while t is the time of integration uh, t is the time of integration and for the best resolved system the required is around uh, around few days uh, yeah, so in in a time uh, integration time of few days, uh, this best resolved system, which is one thousand solar mass, can be detected uh, with Athena, uh, provided we uh, given the good uh, sky localization given by the laser. Yeah, summary. Uh, now I will conclude here. So laser orbital motion breaks degeneracy among binary parameters, resulting in better parameter estimation. Uh, errors on distance and uh, is around one percent. Low sky localization is 0.5 square degrees. And collision time we are measuring within accuracy of 10 seconds and one week, even one week before uh, merger. At one week prior to merger, source uh, source localization is for all the sources is within within the field of view of uh, field of view of electromagnetic telescopes such as uh, Athena and uh, LSST. Uh, so given this good sky localization, we can give early warning to the electromagnetic. Uh, telescopes and uh, this produce a unique opportunity of exploring the environment and formation of these intermediate mass binary black holes by possible electromagnetic follow up. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Sajad.
Um, let's see. So uh, we have a few minutes left for questions before we take our coffee break. I am scrolling through the chat here because I've been having some uh, uh, sidebar conversations with the IT host to make sure everything's running smoothly. I did have a little bit of an interrupt uh, and couldn't hear Sajad very well for, for just a little bit. But what I understand is that uh, it came through loud and clear on the YouTube. Um, so you can always go back and, and catch that if that happened to you as well. Um, are there any questions for Sajad uh, in the chat? I haven't seen any um, in the chat. There's been a discussion of the previous talk uh, going on a little bit as well. Um, while people are, are uh, coming up with their questions and typing them into the chat, um, I can ask a quick question, which is uh, uh, may, maybe a little bit un unfair given that this work is uh, comparatively new to the first talk. But in the first talk, Sylvan showed us how there's a, a a vast difference in the kinds of localizations and such that you come up with depending upon the extrinsic parameters of the system, just how they happen to be oriented uh, to us, how they where they happen to be on the sky. Um, there could be many orders of magnitude difference. Um, do you have a, a, an expectation or a sense as to whether there'll be a similar kind of variation for these sources? Variation due to what, sorry? Uh, well, you have to, so it, if I understand correctly, most of the, the parameters that you are varying are, I guess, what I would call sort of intrinsic parameters. The the masses of the source, their their distance, um, you know, things that that are are um, we're interested in astrophysically, as opposed to uh, kind of nuisance parameters like how the system happens to be oriented on the sky or where it yeah, happens yeah, to be so, on the sky. So, yeah, we have actually. So I, I said in the first uh, when I. Uh, explain the SNR plot. So we are choosing four representative systems, four masses, okay. And for each of the system, we are making 1000 realizations. And, uh, and those uh, on the four angles, those theta phi's, which uh, we determine the sky or sky position and orientation, those are randomly drawn from a uniform distribution. And right. then we are taking the median values of those. I mean, we are, we are distributing 1000 sources or a sphere at one three years, Three giga per sec, and then we are getting uh, dra drawing those angles which determine the sky position or orientation from a uniform distribution. Y yes. So I guess the question, um, if I would put it more succinctly, would be the uh, the size of the error bars. You know, how, how representative is the median? What kind of distribution is it? Um, in in Sylvan's case, for the massive black holes, uh, I think he showed pretty convincingly that the the error bars between you know, these thousand realizations uh, between the best localized and the worst localized or the most SNR and the, and the least SNR, even for the same set of parameters uh, can be quite large just because of the random draws on sky position. Yeah, so that's why we are taking these median values around large, uh, I mean, 1000, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, well, it might, it might be worth looking into the statistics because uh, I think it's a, a experience, a common experience in astronomy that these rare sources, you know, perhaps like the first uh, the first gravitational wave detected with uh, LIGO, right? They happen to be a little bit odd, uh, and that makes them bright. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're not interesting. In fact, they're often some of the most interesting sources are the the ones that are out on the tails of the distribution. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you. For that. Um, okay. Well, I don't see any other questions in the chat. Again, uh, people can produce questions into the YouTube. Uh, there can be some conversation offline. There can also, uh, you can find the speakers in the conference uh, web portal, uh, get in touch with them, uh, you know, hopefully foster some collaborations and discussions. Uh, we are now going to move to a coffee break.